Coming up on today's show. I was also amazed at how many kids were going through the high school that couldn't read. And um, I would bring in the newspaper. I would bring the sports page in particular and really just sit there. and We would read together the articles. Peace be with you. This is Catholic Sports Radio, located at the intersection of your faith life and sports life, and on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, YouTube, and lots and lots of other platforms. I am Bruce Wozniak, talking with Catholic guests who are current or former athletes, coaches, referees, umpires, clergy, administrators, and more from the pro, amateur, and scholastic ranks about the intersection of their faith life and their sports life. The show website is catholicsportsradio.net or .com. They'll both get you to the same place. Be sure that you have signed up there for free for the Catholic Sports Radio e-newsletter that gets sent out each Monday. That's all, just once a week. While you are on the website signing up for the newsletter, look at the top of any page on the site, and you will see social media links, logos for this show, meaning Facebook, X, Instagram, and YouTube, so that you can engage with me and the show that way. The Catholic Sports Radio community is the Facebook group consisting of listeners of this show and some past guests. That is free to join, and you can also find a link for that too on catholicsportsradio.net. Incidentally, for those of you who get the e-newsletter every Monday, you read when I was asking to get one more member in the Facebook group so we could hit 100, and we did. We actually surpassed it, so thank you. I do truly enjoy hearing from listeners, social media, as well as the website. I'll give you the opportunity to contact me, as does traditional email, which you can do through bruce at catholicsportsradio.net. Now on to my ministry moment for this episode. It has left an impression on me how many runners there have been as guests on this show. Specifically, I'm referring to the fact that it often comes up in conversation about being out there alone and the opportunity to be in nature and connect with our Heavenly Father, have that peace to try to be in union with God. But I take a step back and I look at that environment and see that although it's an individual sport, typically we have talked on Catholic Sports Radio about competitions, be they track and field or cross country or even a marathon, or a half marathon. In other words, I reminded myself that there are plenty of instances where there are brothers and sisters in Christ all around us if we only stop to recognize such. For this, I turn to the New Testament and a passage from the book of Romans. Specifically, in chapter 15, verse 5, you're going to love this. It says, quote, May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to think in harmony with one another in keeping with Christ Jesus. I remember talking on a recent episode of Catholic Sports Radio about how my cardiologist sent me to a neurologist who then ordered some tests for me. In this day and age, you go for something like those, and instead of focusing on the tests and what might they find and everything involved with them, you find yourself wondering, How much is this going to cost me? Are you tired of overpaying for your health care or being limited to a provider network? Look no further than Christian Healthcare Ministries. CHM has affordable programs for every Christian and no provider network. Learn more at chministries.org slash catholic-radio. Moving on now with this week's episode, my guest has spent many years working in sports, from being the head football coach at two different high schools in Washington State to having been an assistant football coach at a third. In addition, he developed a program with the Washington Officials Association and the Pacific 10 Conference in tribute to a high school football coach who passed away from cancer. His work in sports also extends to having been a part of two Major League Baseball front offices, the Atlanta Braves and then the Seattle Mariners. On the faith side, he was director of development at the largest Catholic elementary school in the Pacific Northwest. Welcome to Catholic Sports Radio, Juan Cotto. 
Bruce, it's a pleasure to be here with you this morning. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. And I have to wonder, you have lived in Atlanta, New York, Seattle, even attended college in Oregon. So where exactly were you born and raised, and what was the family size? I was born and raised in Seattle, Washington. I had a mother that worked at the VA hospital. My father worked at Boeing, and I had two brothers. I have an Irish twin named Andy who was born 13 months after I was, and then my youngest brother, Jose, is four years younger than me. Now, I usually know what the guest is going to say when I ask this next question, but not this week. Juan, was that a Catholic household that you grew up in? What did the faith life look like in the Cotto household when you were a young boy? And for that matter, did you attend Catholic schools? It was very much a Catholic household. My mother was a, a Catholic and, and really raised us in the Catholic faith. In the house, we had uh, your typical pictures, and we had uh, crosses hanging on the wall that she received from pastors in our community. And my mom knew all the pastors mm. um, at the different schools. I was baptized at St. George Church on Beacon Hill, as my two brothers uh, were also baptized there. And uh, we did attend Catholic school. I attended mm. uh, St. Edward's Catholic School in Columbia City in, in the South Seattle area. My father and my mother moved to further in the South into Seattle, and we attended St. Paul's Elementary School. And unfortunately, uh, during the pandemic, both of our schools closed down. Mm. It's a real shame because they really educated children of color in that community at a very, very high level. And then I attended O'Day High School in Seattle, downtown Seattle. It's an all-boys high school of about 450 boys right in the uh, center of the downtown Seattle neighborhood. Uh, Implication being that that was Catholic also? That is, that's a all boys Catholic high school. Wow, wow, fantastic! And it's still operating. Fingers crossed. Yeah, it, it is still operating. Okay. It is thriving actually. Okay. And, and you've heard of many of our alumni, including Nate Burleson, who uh, ah. he seems to be on TV on every television show. <laughs> and then uh, there's a young man who uh, has taken the NBA by storm, uh, who went to Duke University. His name's Paulo Bancaro. Yeah. And then uh, Miles Gaskin is a running back um, right now for the. Uh, Minnesota Vikings, but he had an incredible career at the University of Washington, was also playing for the Miami Dolphins recently. And all three of them came out of your high school? Yes. Amazing, amazing. So on that note, in the intro, I mentioned a lot of time you have spent as a football coach. Was that your sport as a kid? When did you first start playing sports, and which one, or which ones plural, did you participate in? I started playing sports in my mind when I was about four years old. I I would go out in the backyard. My father did something that I thought was really unique, and I and uh, he instead of making a ten foot basketball goal, he made the goal at about seven feet, and um, I could go out and practice, and I, I wouldn't have to heave the ball all the way at a ten foot goal. And um, I started handling the basketball, and uh, you know I was one of those little five foot eight inch point guards by the time I got to high school. But um, I really started my own mind. I, I used to compete against NBA players that I would see on TV. I started playing organized sports when I was about seven years old. I, I got into a you know third and fourth grade basketball. And then my favorite sport, because it was my father's favorite sport, was the sport of baseball. Mm. It, it wasn't that I excelled at it. I had to work really hard at it. But, uh, you know, I, I picked up the game really quickly. Yeah, I could really... Uh, conceptualize what I saw on television, and I was one of those people that could take it out to the field. And, you know, I would hit balls off tees and work on throwing and catching. And uh, sometimes when I didn't have a, people to do it with me, I would just go to a, and practice against a wall or, you know, go to the park and just, you know, take a bucket of balls and throw them into a fence and try to get my arm stronger. And then um, I played football in middle school, but my grades got bad in the fall and my mom, you know, told me if my grades weren't going to improve, she would take me out the team. And uh, one time she did. So mm-hmm. that was always the priority in our house, was making sure that your grades were good. And then uh, by the time I got to high school, I, I participated in the sport of football. Okay. But my personal favorite sport was baseball. Ended up taking it and uh, going to a small school in Oregon. After two years of community college here in the Seattle area, I went to a small school in Oregon, Western Oregon, which is located in Monmouth, Oregon. It's now Western Oregon University. I received my bachelor's degree in social science. I was elected student body president and had a uh, a nice little decent baseball career on the side. 
See, an audience, I tell you that I don't give the guest the questions in advance, but my gosh, Juan is just setting these up so perfectly for me because what I intended on asking next was, Juan, to forward to where we are right now at that point in your life, you graduated from college in Oregon in 1988, and one year later, you're all the way down in Georgia working as a marketing representative for the Atlanta Braves. I see these entries, by the way, folks, on a six-page resume of wands that was emailed to me in the lead up to this interview. And I bring that up because what I'm wondering and what I'm seeing, was that a case of solely being focused on getting out in the proverbial real world and being focused just on starting a professional career and getting that resume going fresh out of college, moving across the country, starting a new job with the Atlanta Braves? Or were you actually managing to stay active in your faith life through all that? I was um, staying active in my faith life. It's such a beautiful question. Bruce, last night uh, here in Seattle, um, I hosted Wendy Lewis. And I I hope you uh, take a look at this film or try to find it. She um, did a documentary film on two people, Herb Carnegie, who's an NHL trailblazer, uh, a black Canadian who was ultimately put into the Hockey Hall of Fame and uh, has had a, a tremendous impact on the sport of hockey, and Buck O'Neill, who was a, a Negro League legend. And what makes Wendy Lewis special is that she um, is now a producer of films, and she was a former executive in Major League Baseball. Uh, she was a, the executive vice president of diversity in Major League Baseball. She was the executive vice president for the Chicago Cubs. But when she was a, a young marketing coordinator in human resources, she ran the internship program, and she hired me out of college. Mm. And uh, I went back to Chicago and did an internship. I was at baseball practice one day, and the scout that was there was from the Chicago Cubs. And he said, hey, Juan, I heard that you are a student body president. And I said, I am. And he goes, what do you plan on doing after uh, college? And I said, I hope to play baseball. And he said, Juan, you're not going to play baseball. Mm. But um, he said, there's some front office positions that we're looking for, and we're looking for interns. Would you be interested? And he was the one that connected me uh, with the Chicago Cubs organization, and uh, they flew me out for an interview, uh, and uh, the interview went very well. And Miss Lewis offered me the position. Wow. And um, we hosted her film last night as a community event here in Seattle. And it was really special because, you know, you uh, do these types of positions, these internship positions, and you hope that that's going to build a foundation. And certainly it did from a professional sense. But I thought that uh, when I was in Chicago, it was such a unique thing. I, uh, I wasn't making a lot of money. I was making between a, a, about 500 bucks a month as an intern. But it was the Catholic community. I would go to a mass on Sunday night. And they would have meals at the mass, and I would eat and get to know the community there and share Mm. that I went to a school that was uh, affiliated with the Brothers of the Christian Order. And people were very impressed that I was familiar with the Brothers of the Christian Order, which had originated out of Chicago. And a number of the teachers that I had um, at O'Day High School were from Chicago. So it was a really unique connection for me. And also, Bruce, in Seattle, the African-American community, we have St. Therese Church, but the black community is very, very small in the Catholic Church in Seattle. I just found it was really refreshing to be in a Catholic community that was much larger in Chicago, and to be able to exercise that part of my faith with people who look like me, which was something that was just a little bit different from the community which I grew up in. So my Catholic faith uh, certainly served me there. And also when I went to Atlanta, you know, people always said, geez, you know, you were 23 years old, you were going to these places all by yourself. Yeah. But on Sunday night, I would meet people in the community. And, um, you know, after going to church for several months, I never felt like I was by myself. I felt like wow. I had friends. And I felt like I had a community that supported me. Wow, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. How do you go, though, from working for the Atlanta Braves one year and the Seattle Mariners the next year to granted, a decade or so later, ending up as director of development at the largest Catholic elementary school in the Pacific Northwest, meaning what was happening in your faith life over those 10 or so years as it relates to potentially feeling you wanted to be in a Catholic environment in your professional life? Was that by chance the case, or is it me trying to project my ministry onto you and your journey? You know, it's so interesting how you are pursuing things and in your mind as a child and my mom always says youth is wasted on the young but you're chasing titles you're chasing titles and you're looking to be somebody 
it was really, really interesting. I will kind of fill in the part that you're missing on the resume is that, uh, you know, I'm working for the Braves, I'm working for the Mariners, and the positions were fun, but it was so much work when you're working in professional sports. It's not even about the salary. It it becomes a vocation, and I just didn't feel like I was really uh, fulfilling my full potential. Mm. And the Mariners, I had a really nice position. I was a marketing representative of selling group and season tickets. And the Mariners at that time, it was right around the early stages of Ken Griffey Jr. Mm. And Bruce, that time the team uh, was still teetering on the potential of maybe even leaving town. Mm. And uh, we still had a lot of things that happened before the 1995 season. But uh, in the early 1990s, it was a fun position. And it was fun to walk around with those business cards and show people that you work for the Seattle Mariners. But my heart never really felt connected to the work. Mm. I eventually ended up going back to graduate school. And then, um, you know, I've always been interested in the political movement and the social movement, and that's where I ended up working for a lady by the name of Patty Murray, who was running for the uh, U.S. Senate, and she was by far the least funded, the biggest underdog, maybe in the country, mm. and uh, she won the Democratic primary, and then um, that, that really transformed all of us. We went from a group of young, uh, you know, 20-somethings to uh, major political consultants and, wow. and people who... Uh, we're working for this unbelievable campaign. She ended up getting elected to the U.S. Senate in 1992, wow. and she's been there ever since. She's now the Senate pro tem and still have a wonderful relationship with her. She is also Catholic, and um, mm-hmm. I was at the funeral of both of her parents. I have uh, relationships with uh, her brother, Greg Johns, who was a former news reporter, sports reporter for the Everett Washington newspaper, and uh, he and I contact periodically. But the bottom line issue is is that uh, that was compelling work for me. And um, I ended up working for Patty for a year. I ended up working for our first Asian-American elected King County executive, Gary Locke, for the three years that he was the county executive. And the biggest thing that we had to deal with, Bruce, was the stadium issue. We had an, a, 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 some sagging tiles in the kingdom that fell off of oh, the, uh, the surface right. at the top of it. That's right. And I that forgot was a game that. against Cleveland. They had to put in a new type of material on the stadium surface at the roof. But that was a major thing that happened. And then ultimately, the Seahawks owner, Ken Baring, said he was moving the team because of the facility. So we knew we had to do some things in regards to the stadiums. The first was when we passed a public measure to build a new baseball stadium. And then uh, a couple of years later, we were able to pass a public measure to put a a football stadium together after Paul Allen built the Seahawks. And I was involved in those from a public policy perspective back then. So it was exciting times. And and then um, I I had this crazy notion that it was my turn to be elected. And um, I I lost a very, very difficult campaign for the Washington State Legislature in 1998. Mm. And, Bruce, that's where I reconnected on a lot of different things because – when you're 33 years old and you you know you lose an election that you really 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 wanted to win you really have to take a look at your life and look at the fundamentals of your life and and i realized there were things that were bigger than the public office at the time i was really really hurt but um i i now realize that it was a really a catalyst period for my life and um with my catholic faith with my friends and family around me. And as you can imagine, a lot of friends of mine uh, left. Mm. You know, you're not the person that they think you are. You don't have the access that they think you do, wow. and you they leave. And that, to me, was uh, an opportunity to really reconnect myself, not only with God and my faith, but also with myself, mm. and to figure out, you kind of redefine myself. And then um, I took nine months where I was trying to figure some things out, and I saw the ad in the paper uh, in, on the uh, Catholic website at the time that uh, was looking for the development officer at St. Joseph's School, and um, I had a wonderful conversation. I, I, and it was, a, it was certainly an interview with George Hofbauer, who was the 38-year principal who happened to be from Chicago, and I told him where I was in my life, and it ended up being an incredible fit for mm, And it really, it not only reconnected me with the Catholic environment and my faith, but uh, life has a way of humbling you. Yeah. And I felt certainly my experience in politics had somewhat produced tremendous highs, but it also there were some humbling moments. 
And I tell people, you know, you spend a, a bulk of your life trying to be somebody. And I realized through my Catholic faith, you know, I am somebody. And it's not about winning elections. And it's not about the prestige. It's not about saying that you're a, a marketing representative from the Seattle Mariners. You start to realize that, you know, being a child of God and, and being connected to this faith and then the teachings of Jesus Christ and the relationships you build through that, that is ultimately what makes you the person you are. Amen. And it took me a little while to figure that out. Amen. Amen. Wonderfully said. Wonderfully said. And folks, since Juan is up in the Seattle area, I do immediately think of the Seahawks. And our friend Abraham Lucas, their offensive tackle, he was a guest on this show back in April of last year. That was episode 219, if you never heard it and want to go back and listen. Of course, my NFL team is the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. A team sport like football, to name just one example, has really shown how much we rely on specialty coaches, such as a quarterback's coach or a special team's coach, to name just two. Why wouldn't a similar investment be made for something that's a major part of our life away from sports? Freedom coaching. A Catholic-based service, they will work one-on-one with you, regardless of your location, to help you break free from pornography. Visit freedom-coaching.net to get started towards freeing yourself from the compulsion to pornography today. If you are watching the episode numbers of Catholic Sports Radio, you see that we are coming up on a huge milestone in two weeks, what will be episode 300. I say we because we are all in this together as brothers and sisters in Christ. We are in community with one another, and through this ministry, We do things like hit a significant plateau together. I often say that without the audience, it would essentially just be me and the guest having a telephone conversation. I've also said that it was important to me that the Facebook group have the word community in the name so that we have another opportunity through that platform to be in community with one another. Prayers, a Facebook group, in-person events, there are lots of ways that we can support one another and lift each other up. Of course, a way that you can support Catholic Sports Radio is through a financial gift. Despite coming up on the 300th episode of this show, I still do not get any income from doing this show, which makes it challenging when it comes to not only all the time I put into running Catholic Sports Radio on and off the air, but all the bills that come in to operate this ministry. I do my best to make sure that I report to you on the air exact expenses So you have examples of real costs, meaning both how much as well as what they are for. If you see value in all that I do through Catholic Sports Radio on and off the air and you enjoy the show, you appreciate the work that I do, and you want to support my ongoing efforts, I would be most grateful for you to include this ministry as part of your tithing. On the homepage of catholicsportsradio.net or .com, they'll both get you to the same place. There is a blue Donate to CSR button. As guests and listeners who have used that would attest, that blue button is a fast, easy, and secure way to make a financial gift. That will allow you to use a credit card, debit card, or even PayPal. Alternatively, though, if you prefer, since I know some people do not like putting payment information on the Internet, you can get in touch with me through social media, the website, or email for details on sending a check through the mail. Bruce at CatholicSportsRadio.net is how you can write to me. Regardless of which method you use, the blue Donate to CSR button on the website or sending me a check, with your permission, I will happily say your name on the air on an upcoming episode of the show as a public thanks, just like you have heard me do on other episodes when guests or listeners have made a contribution. Or as some people have instructed me to do, you can ask to remain anonymous. I'm grateful for your considering Catholic Sports Radio as part of your tithing as I continue working to move more people closer to Christ through the mix of faith and sports. Juan, before I ask you about the football coaching jobs that I rattled off in the intro, I really admire the project that you undertook that I also mentioned when I first brought you on. It's something that I look at and I see a servant's heart. I'm referring to the Blue Flags program, which you developed for prostate cancer promotion and audience. This is an example of something you can do to mix faith and sports, meaning there's not an overt attempt here to bring people to Christ, but you can let your Christian heart take over and say, I just want to do good and help others. So Juan, just talk a bit more about that Blue Flags program and all that you did with that. 
after I left um, my director of development position at uh, St. Joseph School, I worked for the prestigious Fred Hatch Cancer Research Center here in Seattle. I was director of community outreach, looking to engage minority communities in cancer research. And sports is such a huge part of the minority community in the lexicon and, and how people uh, you know, participate and, and follow teams. And I thought that this would be a unique way to do it. We, uh, I worked with a gentleman by the name of Kevin Griffin, who was at the time working with the Seattle Seahawks. And we were trying to figure out ways that we could, could utilize that light blue color that they had. And we thought, what if in the high school games we threw blue flags? And, and our officials association in Washington State loved the idea. They loved it so much that uh, we had a couple of officials whose lives were touched by prostate cancer. And Bruce, one official, when we used the flags, he said, you know something, I, I need to go get my own checkup. And he found out that he had prostate cancer. Whoa. So it was amazing that um, through the use of the flags, that we were getting people who were going to the doctor and mm. really learning more about uh, the DRE, the digital rectal examinations, and learning more about prostate cancer. It was amazing that the feedback that we received. So it was a really unique partnership with the Washington officials, and I have to give them all the credit. The first year that we did it, Bruce, there were no uh, flags available to us. So we went to a hardware store in Seattle, and we bought all of this blue material, and we <laughs> cut the shapes, oh and gosh. we put Super Bowls and, and zip ties. <laughs> and, and officials, people don't realize this, you know, the officials don't just have one flag. They have three of them. So we had about... Uh, 600 officials at the time, we had to make 1,800 flags. Oh, my gosh. Then we found a company in the southeast, and they ended up making the flags for us the next year at a really good price because they also wanted to participate in the promotion. Mm. And then um, it was amazing, the PAC-12 at the time, and I can't remember the name of the commissioner, but he called us, and he said, hey, I saw that you were doing that. We want to do that. Whoa. And I'll never forget watching uh, – it was Arizona versus Washington, and uh, Nick Foles was the quarterback. And you'd see him out there, and, and you'd see uh, the blue flags being tossed. And it was just a really unique way Whoa. to highlight the work around prostate cancer research. So cool, so cool. And, folks, that blue flags program that Juan developed did receive the Communitas Award for Excellence in Community Service. Let's get into all the football coaching now, keeping in mind that you had already had the run as director of development at the largest Catholic elementary school in the Pacific Northwest, and now here you are coaching at what I'm assuming were public high schools. Were those coaching jobs like the Blue Flags program, meaning I obviously wasn't outwardly preaching the gospel, Bruce, to my student-athletes, but I was trying to be a leader of men, meaning not just teaching X's and O's? Yeah, uh, i got to be honest with you both. I worked for a wonderful football coach by the name of Hoover Hopkins, and then I, I spent time with him three years up at Nathan Hale High School. And uh, we had a tremendous run up there. I think when Hoover had got there, it was one of the longer losing streaks in the state of Washington. I think they had lost um, at least 15 games in a row. We ended up losing another eight in a row, and we finally won our last game of the season, which was phenomenal. And uh, you know, all the work that we put in and we installed the wing T offense. And for folks who are unfamiliar with football, it's more of a team oriented offense. And there's a lot for the kids to learn, the offensive linemen to learn and the quarterback. You know, I remember Hoover saying that we don't have, uh, we don't have wide receivers here. We have backs and we have linemen and uh, everyone had a responsibility and the kids really had to buy into it. And um, just uh, ending the losing streak was phenomenal. The next year we ended up, going to the playoffs for the first time in many years wow. in Nathan Hale history. And then the following year, the third year we were there in a monumental upset. The private schools don't beat the Catholic schools very often. And there was an article in the paper about this. And, um, you know, it's, it's like a less than, you know, 100 win percentage. And mm. we ended up beating Kennedy High School, which the year before had been in the state playoff game against Bellevue High School and lost in overtime. Oh, my gosh. They had a Division One player by the name of Everett Thompson who was very noticeable on the field. I mean, he, he ended up playing <laughs> for the University of Washington. I think he spent several years with the Arizona Cardinals. And um, I'll never forget walking up the field, and he was just in tears. 
and you see this mammoth high school kid in tears, and you realize how much it means to the kids and how much the game means to the kids. And I remember the euphoria we felt. On our side, we were also crying. It was just a, a, an amazing night. That's when I made the decision, I'm going to do this for a long time. And then the Highline High School position came open, which is a, a rival high school to Kennedy uh, down in the Burien area, which is the city that the airport is located in, if you come into Seattle, uh, down near the SeaTac Airport. I uh, was a very, very fortunate after three years of being an assistant coach that they hired me. And um, I was able to put a staff together of people in the community. And the other thing I thought was interesting, Bruce, and I'll mention it, um, it's not only being a leader of men at the, uh, you know, leading high school boys, but a lot of black coaches, they're attracted to the black head coach. They feel it gives them a better opportunity. And I don't know why that is, but um, I ended up getting a lot of people who were some extremely good football coaches, but who never had an opportunity to be uh, an offensive or defensive coordinator at the high school level. I coordinated special teams, and you know, I just wanted to put a special emphasis on that. But the school uh, was in an older and more dilapidated building. Two new high schools had been built recently, and that's where most of the kids were going. So we weren't attracting a lot of kids with the facilities where the school was located. But um, we recruited the building, and we would get kids to turn out, and we would get them in the best shape we could. You know, and by golly, we won football games too. I mean, we didn't uh, we didn't win as many as we wanted to, but um, when I had got to Highline High School, there were um, sixty eight kids in the program out of eighty were academically ineligible. Mm. So I knew that we had to connect with them on an academic level. Yeah. What I found out, Bruce, was that a lot of the kids were raising themselves. Oh boy. They had family situations where the parents were either not involved or, and in many cases, had um, problems with the authorities and then were in, incarcerated. So um, a number of them had been emancipated to different family members, and you really were a father figure. Yeah. You know, I would do my 6 o'clock in the morning strength and conditioning, but a lot of that was dedicated to study. I was also amazed at how many kids were going through the high school that couldn't read. And um, I would bring in the newspaper. I would bring the sports page in particular, and I would bring in sports mm. illustrated magazines that I had, and, and really just sit there. And we would read together the articles, and it's amazing when you put a sports page in front of the kids. And at the time, the Seattle SuperSonics were here, and everyone loves basketball. But it's amazing how the kids can read about basketball. And I just, yeah. you know, we really yeah. worked to get the kids' reading level up, and I would have them write articles. Write an article where you played in football. Game. Wow, what a great idea. They would write stories that, you know, I, I rushed for 200 yards. You know, I blocked this guy. and wow. Coach Cotto put me in the game. And, and, and it was really amazing to hear their imagination and to get them writing and to get them thinking in that mindset. And um, I still uh, have and good friends with a number of the kids there. And I always tell them, I, I hope you got as much out of it as I did because mm. it was really a true learning experience. And uh, Jerry Bamberg, the athletic director, and, and we're still friends to this day, and um, a number of the folks down there, Jackie Smith, who was the assistant principal at the time, and Mike Fosberg, and, and so many of the other athletic folks who just, you know, they believed in me and they worked with me. And we were able to build a program where I felt that we were able to develop young people. Okay, now i got to ask you this. And audience, you heard earlier that I referred to episode 219 of this show from April of last year with Abraham Lucas from the Seattle Seahawks. And on episode 226, my guest was basketball Hall of Fame coach Lenny Wilkins, who guided the Seattle Supersonics to the championship in 1978-79. And during that interview, he said to me that he thinks the NBA will return to Seattle. So, Juan, you've worked in government positions there. What do you think? Will we see an NBA team back in the Emerald City? You know, I, I think it, it, the economics of it are really at the level of the NBA. They've, what, they've got 32 pieces of pie. What is the cost of expanding it to 34, I think, is the real question. And I, I, I believe that there is a market here. I believe there's a strong market here. I believe the NBA realized that when they left. Mm -hmm. They left a 40-plus year market that was, uh, you know, it was such a tragedy for the city. And I think, ultimately, I don't think that was the best decision for the NBA. So you know, the owners, when you think about expansion, it's very, very difficult for the fans to understand what happens to their pots, which is why it has become so much more expensive to buy into the NBA. So if the economics makes sense to the owners, 
I think there'll be an opportunity. I think there's there's a ready, willing, and uh, able market here. There's a very, very, very serviceable building here now. Climate Pledge Arena is a fantastic venue, and uh, it's configured for obviously for hockey and basketball, and all of the uh, the transportation issues certainly with the Seattle Kraken have been taken care of, and people are used to going back to the Seattle Center Arena area mm-hmm. again. Very nice. So um, if it makes sense economically to the NBA and to Commissioner Silver and they can work out the details, I think there will be basketball. But, uh, you know, we'll see how that story yeah. speaks itself yeah. out. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. We're in the home stretch, but I want to give you an opportunity to highlight whatever you would like from your faith life that we have not covered so far. Maybe a mission trip or a pilgrimage or a retreat you went on or maybe a favorite saint or your go-to scripture passage or just some other story about living out your Catholic faith. My life changed completely on June 29th, 2011. My uh, five-and-a-half-month-old son, Salvador Miguel, was killed in a very, very tragic accident. Mm. And um, when you lose a child and Bruce, um, going back to the family, my mother and father, about uh, four months before I was born, unfortunately, in a, in a very, very, very tragic fire, they lost their three children. Oh. And I had uh, two brothers and a sister, and I, I, oh. I don't know how you come back from something like that. And then I tell my mom all the time, you know, I, you're a phenomenal individual because you build a structure around yourself. You have to to come back from something like that. And certainly uh, your Catholic faith is a big part of that. And um, my wife, Sarah, is a Catholic. She's very active and involved in a lot of things at St. Therese, our parish here in Seattle. You know, I, there are times where I feel that I need to have the support of the Catholic community. You build a structure around your faith, and your faith is just so critical. And the people who resonate with you are usually people who have gone through you know, similar experiences of loss and challenge. For me, it's far more than just a single verse or, or you know, a certain section of the Bible. Um, you know, I, I've uh, grown uh, the affinity of uh, Toby Mac and uh, DC Talk. Uh, their music has been very, very inspiring, and, and I get a connection from it. Israel Houghton, a lot of gospel singers um, uh, over the last decade have built a connection to my Catholic faith through a lot of Christian music, because I feel like I had to kind of immerse myself in it to make sure that my mind was right, because when your mind is right, then your body and your spirit can be right. When That's your right. spirit's right, then you can really impact people. That's right. I think it's an internal metamorphosis, and I, I went through some challenging thoughts, but because of your Catholic faith and because of the way I, I feel like I chose to do it, I was able to get my mind right and um, the freedom to be able to live without the blame and without hatred and mm. without catching stuff on situations and, and I'm hopefully being an inspiration to my wife and my children Praise God. so we can get through the whole situation Praise and that God. was a big challenge so I really learned that no situation is too big and that no situation can't be overcome because you know I have the equipment to do it you just have to tap into it and believe. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. And since you mentioned them, let's close by having you share about your wife, how long the two of you have been married, and the family that the two of you have made. Yeah, Sarah and I have been married on uh, July 15th. We celebrated 18 years of marriage. So um, she's put up with me for that long, you know, and uh, we, we laughed and so, you know, people go, geez, you know, uh, about a football wife, and Sarah's a Pittsburgh Steelers fan, and she, um, I mean, every first down is a big deal that the Pittsburgh Steelers get in our <laughs> house, so that's always fun to see how uh, people from that part of the country root for their team and support their team, and she certainly uh, embodies that. But uh, we've been married 18 years, and uh, she the entire football coaching thing with me, and she was a phenomenal football wife and then supportive to kids in our program and supportive to parents in our program and, and played a major role there. We have our three children, um, Salvador, who I referenced, who passed away in uh, June of 2011. But Clemente is our oldest. He was born in October in the middle of football season in 2007 when I was coaching at Nathan Hale. And he's a junior at O'Day High School. And he's uh, out there trying to be somebody. He's a running back and, and a free safety. And mm-hmm. he also plays baseball and uh an extremely good student, which uh, he's told about all the time by, by teachers at the school, but you're way smarter than your dad is. <laughs> and then um, my daughter, Araceli, who is the love of my life, she's 11 years old, and she is 
a uh, sixth grader at St. Joseph School. Outstanding. Sarah is uh, an amazing church leader at St. Therese, and she's up there every Sunday, and she uh, gets those two kids out of bed, and they don't argue with her. They get themselves <laughs> ready, and they go up to the building every Sunday, and, and it's a big part of our lives. Outstanding. Outstanding. Juan, so great to meet you. Thank you for making time to be on Catholic Sports Radio. Really enjoyed the conversation, and God bless you and your family. Thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity, and uh, thanks so much for inviting me to be on the show. My pleasure. My pleasure. And folks, as a nod to all the coaching that Juan has done, I thought it'd be fitting if we close this week's episode with a prayer for coaches. So let's do that together right now in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. From 1 Thessalonians 5. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up as you are already doing. Thank you, God, for the love and compassion you show me when I fall short of your expectations. Help me to inspire those I interact with to be what you know they could be. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks so much for listening. This is Catholic Sports Radio. Find more at catholicsportsradio.net, as well as on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. It is at Cath Sports Radio on all those. C-A-T-H, at Cath Sports Radio. I'm Bruce Wozniak, and remember, it's not whether you win or lose, it's that it's Jesus that you always choose.